Chapter Eight, Part One of The Seven Stairs by Stuart Brent. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight On the Avenue, Part One. In all my life, I had never shopped on Michigan Avenue. I had no idea who was in business there or what they sold except for a general feeling that they sold expensive merchandise and made plenty of money. It was only after I had opened the doors of Stuart, Brent, Books, and Records that I discovered what a strategic location I had chosen, strategically in competition with two of the best-known book dealers in the city. Only a block down the street was the Main Street Bookstore, already a fixture on the avenue for a decade. A few blocks farther south stood Crocs, Chicago's largest bookseller and one of the greatest in America, while north of me the Michigan Avenue branch of Lyon and Healy, the great music store, still flourished. And I thought what the avenue needed was Stuart Brent with his books and records. Maybe it was, but the outlook did not seem propitious. Now, ten years later, Main Street and I are still selling books and not, I think, suffering from each other's proximity. Main Street's orientation has always been toward art, and they run a distinguished gallery in connection with their business. Lyon and Healy eventually closed its branch operation and Crocs left the avenue when they merged with Brentano, an equally large organization with which I have no family connection, on the Italian side or any other. These consolidations, I am sure, were simply manifestations of big business. If I were to fret about the competition, it would be that of the dime store next door, which sells books and records, too. In addition to the street-level floor, my new shop had a fine basement room which I fitted out, hopefully, as a meeting place. I immediately began staging lectures and parties and put in a grand piano so we could have concerts, too. Anything to bring in people. Business grew, but as I soon found, I would have to sell things besides books in order to meet the overhead— I compromised on long-standing principles and brought in greeting cards. Within six months, I was also selling how-to-do-it books, how to eat, how to sleep, how to love, how to fix the leaky pipe in your basement, how to pet your cat, how to care for your dog, how to see the stars. By the time I had been on the avenue a year, it was hard for me to see how my shop differed from any other where you might find some good books and records if you looked under the pop numbers and best sellers. Apparently, some people still found a difference, however. In his book, The Literary Situation, Malcolm Cowley, the distinguished critic, wrote, quote, on Michigan Avenue, I passed another shop and recognized the name on the window. Although the sales room wasn't large, it was filled with new books lining the walls or piled on tables. There were also two big racks of long-playing records, and a hidden phonograph was playing Mozart as I entered, feeling again that I was a long way from Clark and Division. The books on the shelves included almost everything published during the last two or three years that I had any curiosity about reading. In two fields, the collection was especially good, psychiatry and books by Chicago authors. I introduced myself to the proprietor, Stuart Brent, and found that he was passionately interested in books in the solution of other people's personal problems and in his native city. Many of his customers are young people just out of college. Sometimes they tell him about their problems, and he says to them, 
read this book you might find the answer here he is mildly famous in the trade for his ability to sell hundreds of copies of a book that arouses his enthusiasm for example he had probably found more readers for harry stack sullivan's an interpersonal theory of psychiatry than any other dealer in the country even the largest collections of stories are usually slow-moving items in bookstores although they have proved to be more popular as paperbacks one evening brent amazed the publisher of nelson algren's stories the neon wilderness by selling a thousand copies of the hardcover book at an autograph party we talked about the days when the near north side was full of young authors many of whom became famous new yorkers and about the possibility of another chicago renaissance as in the years after nineteen fifteen brent would like to do something to encourage such a movement he complained that most of the other booksellers didn't regard themselves as integrated parts of the community and that they didn't take enough interest in the personal needs of their customers Brent's complaint against the booksellers may well have been justified from his point of view, but a visitor wouldn't expect to find that any large professional group was marked by his combination of interest in persons, interest in the cultural welfare of the community, and abounding energy. As a group, the booksellers I have met in many parts of the country are widely read obliging likable persons who regard bookselling as a profession and work hard at it for lower incomes than they might receive from other activities they would all like to sell more books in quantities like those of the paperbacks and drug stores and on the newsstands but they are dealing in more expensive articles for which the public seems to be limited End quote the literary situation was published by viking press in nineteen fifty four i had met mr cowley on a january evening the year before when he came in tall and distinguished looking i had given him a chance to browse before asking if i could be of assistance he smiled when i offered my help then asked if i had a copy of exile's return i did he fingered the volume and asked if i made a living selling books of course i said slightly miffed but who in chicago buys books like the ones you have on these shelves he asked lots and lots of people i assured him i still didn't know he was baiting me we began to talk about chicago as i now saw it and as it had been in a moment he was off on bug house square chicago's miniature hyde park the lamented dill pickle club the young hemingway ben hecht charlie MacArthur, dreiser sherwood anderson archibald mcleish sinclair lewis i had to ask his name and when he said malcolm cowley i took exile's return away from him and asked him to autograph it to me he took the book back and wrote to stuart brent a real bookstore i felt better about being on the avenue the next evening mr and mrs cowley came to one of our concerts in the downstairs room and heard badura skoda and irene jonas play a duo recital America lacks the cafes and coffee-houses that serve as literary meeting-places in all European countries. I had high hopes for our basement room, with its piano and hi-fi set and tables and comfortable chairs as a place for such interchange. In addition to our concerts, lectures, and art exhibits— there were saturday afternoon gatherings of men and women from a wide range of professions and disciplines who dropped in to talk and entertain each other we served them coffee and strudel 
possibly the most memorable of our concerts was that played by william primrose he had promised long ago to do one if i ever had a shop with the facilities for it we had them now and quite suddenly primrose called to announce that he would be stopping over in chicago on his way to play with the boston symphony orchestra and would be delighted to present us with a recital there were only a few days to prepare for the event as soon as the word was out we were deluged with phone calls our concert hall would seat only fifty people so i decided to clear the floor on the street level rent two hundred chairs for the overflow audience and pipe the music up to them from the downstairs room i hired a crew of experts to arrange the microphones and set up the speakers the show did not start with any particular aplomb and it got worse for me at least as the evening progressed primrose came early to practice it hadn't occurred to me that he needed to he wanted not only to practice but moreover a place in which he could do so undisturbed since the concert hall was swarming with electricians not to mention the porter setting up chairs while i ran up and down the stairs alternating between a prima donna and a major domo it looked as though another place would have to be found for a primrose to practice i therefore took the great violist into a basement storage room that served as a catch-all shared by my shop and the drug store next door but primrose settled down happily in the dirty poorly lit room amid stacks of old bills christmas decorations old shelves and fixtures empty bottles and cartons of kleenex and went to work in less than ten minutes a little gray man who filled prescriptions came bounding down the stairs screaming where is brent where is brent he caught me in the hall and continued yelling if this infernal racket doesn't stop honest to god i'll call the police it was no use telling him the man making the racket was one of the world's greatest musicians he had never heard of primrose and couldn't have cared less the noise coming up the vents he claimed was not only causing a riot in the drug store but he was so unnerved by the sounds that he had already ruined two prescriptions while he was howling about his losses i began howling with laughter but there seemed nothing to do but get primrose out of that room i moved my star into our receiving room a messy cubby hole ten feet wide he didn't seem to mind although now since he couldn't walk up and down he was confined to sitting in a chair for his practice meantime a crowd far beyond our capacity had swarmed into both levels of the shop those who came early got seats others sat on the stairs leading down to the hall the rest stood and some even spilled out the door onto michigan avenue i couldn't get from one end of the place to the other without stepping on people i found myself begging someone's pardon all evening long then the complaints began those seated in the hall were gasping for air our cooling system simply wasn't up to handling that many people i rushed to the boiler room where the gadgets for controlling the air conditioning were located and tried to improve the situation of course i made it worse finally i introduced primrose to the audience and beat a hasty retreat almost at once an important guest tackled me with his complaints i beat my way upstairs those sitting on the stairs discovered that they were not able to hear a thing and after tripping over dozens of feet and crushing against uncounted bodies was confronted by a thin long woman wearing a turban hat who seized me and amid this utter confusion began telling me i was the most wonderful man alive 
her eyes were burning and every time she took a breath she rolled her tongue across her lips i was fascinated but desperate what do you want i begged willing to do virtually anything to extricate myself i want you to be my agent she said pressing me to the wall i'm an author and i'll have nothing to do with anyone but you i ducked beneath her outstretched arms trampled some people caught my foot in the lead wire to one of the microphones and fell heavily into the lap of one of the most attractive women i have ever seen she fell off her chair onto the floor and i rolled on top of her a folding chair ahead of me collapsed and before anything could be done a dozen lovers of music and literature lay sprawled on top of one another while those not engaged in this chain reaction pronounced menacing shooshes by the time i had righted myself several friends had come up from the concert hall to complain about the noise upstairs finally the concert ended i was later told that william primrose gave a brilliant performance something to be remembered and cherished for a lifetime i would not know all i know is that the most attractive woman in the world in whose lap i landed sent me a bill for eighty dollars to replace the dress which i apparently had torn beyond reconstruction i paid the bill there were other fine parties among them one that grew out of the arrival of a play called mrs mcthing a funny whimsical adroit production which could be the product only of a great goodness of the heart helen hayes and jules munchen were the stars i loved every minute of the play and in addition to being entranced by miss hayes remarkable performance thought jules munchen to be extraordinarily comical in his role one of his telling lines was let's have a meeting no matter what the situation that provoked it the problem might be entirely trivial but before a decision could be made a meeting first took place as things do happen the morning after the play opened in chicago Mr. Munchen walked into the shop along with another member of the cast. It was impossible to greet him with any other words but, Let's have a meeting. We became friends instantly, and when the play neared the end of its run, we decided there should be a farewell party for the cast. Jules asked Miss Hayes if she would come, and I was properly thrilled when she agreed. So on closing night they all came to the bookstore, along with about thirty people Jenny and I had asked to join us. The program did not have to be planned. There was singing, reciting, storytelling. Then, quite by surprise, Miss Hayes' colorful husband joined us. The fun really began, not only in heightened conversation, but when the MacArthur's daughter sat at the piano with Chet Robel and played and sang. Robel is another Chicago original, an artist of the blues and a superb personality and musician who has been playing over the years at Chicago hotels and night spots and always attracts a large and appreciative following. He was part of the cast of Turkle's famous studs place show he represents an almost lost art not only in his old-time jazz musicianship but also in terms of cabaret entertainment the performer who genuinely loves his work and his audience and who will remember ten years later the face of someone he met in a noisy nightclub crowd it was an all-night party i talked with miss hayes about ben hacked who had collaborated with charles macarthur on the front page which opened quite a new page for the american theatre she agreed that ben could talk more sense 
more dramatically than any author we knew. I had had an autographing party for Ben's book, Child of a Century, an autobiographical study of his life and development as a writer. We sold almost 800 copies of the book that night. Ben came with his wife and daughter and sat behind the desk with a cigar in his mouth, his eyes dreamy, his mind tending toward some distant land, but he was most affable while repeating over and over, I've never done such a thing in my whole life, and I've been writing for forty years. Later, Hecht had taken me to the old haunts of the Chicago literary scene. We sat in a tavern he had frequented while working on the now defunct Chicago Journal. He showed me where Hemingway took boxing lessons. We went to the building where Ben had lived on the fourth floor and Hemingway on the floor beneath. It was a time not long past, yet far away and long ago. We viewed the former locale of the Dill Pickle Club, the famous literary tavern. Ben talked to me with personal insight about Sherwood Anderson, Theodore Dreiser, Maxwell Bodenheim, Covici Friday, and others, among them some of whose fame lay in tragic ends, death by drink, suicide, or merciless twists of fate. Not long ago I phoned Ben at his home in Nyack, New York. Red Quinlan, the television executive, had an idea for a series of literary shows to be called You Can't Go Home Again. He had talked to me about being narrator, and I in turn had suggested Ben Hecht for the first interview. Ben, I said, this is Stuart Brent. Do you remember me? There was a flat, yes, as though he didn't really. I'm calling to tell you, I said, that we have a great idea for a TV show, and I want to interview you for it. It's called, I don't want to hear it, he said. I don't want a living thing to do with TV. Don't tell me what you have to say. I don't want to hear it. Wait a minute, I said. You haven't given me a chance. I don't want to give you a chance, he said. I have no use for TV or anybody who writes for TV. It's worse than snaring little girls away from home. You still don't understand, I said. Look, mister, he said, I understand. I just don't want to hear your proposition. I want nothing to do with you or television. Is that clear? Wait a minute, Ben, I said. This is Stuart Brent from Chicago. Don't you remember? Oh, Stu, where are you calling from? From Chicago. Oh, my God, why did you let me run off like that? I thought you were some two-for-a-nickel joker from a television agency. I'm sorry. How are you, baby? Fine, I said but I do want to talk with you about a TV series that I hope I'm going to do. Sorry, baby, the answer's no. Not for any money in the world. Well, how are you financially? Eh, you know, same damn thing, but I don't care. I'm busy killing myself with writing. I've got a hot book coming out soon. Be sure and get a copy. It's really hot. I wish you'd hear what I have to say. It's really a fine idea. Sorry, no. How's the bookstore? So we talked of books and the time I nearly blew a gasket when Ben autographed his book Charlie at another Chicago store. He had sent me a carbon copy of his manuscript on that talented and lovable bum, Charles MacArthur, and I had told him I hoped we could raise a stir with a real party when the book came out. He agreed, having been considerably impressed with the first party we held for him. Ben was in Italy writing a movie scenario when the publication date of Charlie was announced. 
upon receiving a cablegram requesting a chicago autographing party date he wired yes thinking it was to be at my bookstore it wasn't and for weeks after the event was held nobody dared get near me i'm still sorry about that mix-up ben said well okay baby take care of yourself when you get to new york give me a ring and i'll meet you for a drink at the algonquin i remembered my original purpose and tried again for the last time you won't listen to me about this t v thing absolutely irrevocably no good-bye stu i was left pondering about the strange and rather terrifying creature that has been hacked a wise witty man of the world with the disarming gentleness of a tamed jungle beast i thought again of our sentimental revisiting of hectian haunts the small tavern across from bug house square where ben paced off the original setting Quote, in this corner was a stage here were the tables and there were the two chairs that belonged to charlie and me here in this corner we wrote the front page End quote. suddenly he put down his beer and said let's take a taxi over to the campus i want to show you where carl wanderer lived we hadn't traveled far before ben changed the course and directed the cab driver to let us off near the civic opera building we walked down a few stairs into another tavern and ben stood cigar in mouth looking there were a few men at the bar and the bartender leaning on outspread arms and returning ben's look inquiringly have you seen john randolph or michael brown or rudy york ben said no one there had ever heard of them ben muttered under his breath i guess they're all dead he said i used to work with them on the journal american we sat down and ordered a beer i think this must be the place he said but i might have mixed it up we had good times together we had a real ball with this character wanderer do you know the story well wanderer was an ex-army officer who discovered that his wife was pregnant he didn't want the child because he feared it would interfere with resuming his army career he wanted to re-enlist so he arranged for a fake hold-up on ingleside avenue that's where i want to take you now anyway he got a bum off clark street and gave the guy a few dollars to make this hold-up assuring him it was just a trick to be played on his wife for fun wanderer took his wife to the movies that night to a theater if my memory is correct called the midway and on their way home they have to walk almost half a block along the side of a schoolyard the streets are poorly lit and this bum sticks a gun into wanderer and yells this is a stick-up the bum never had a real gun but wanderer did he pretended to struggle with the guy and then shot him turned the gun on his wife too and killed her instantly then he wiped off the gun and shoved it into the bum's dead hand it looked as though the robber had been resisted and somehow shot in the fight. Wanderer became a hero overnight, and the newspapers played him up for all it was worth. Ben and Carl Sandberg, who was then a reporter on the journal, were eventually responsible for breaking the case. They went to interview the hero and came away with mutual misgivings which they confided to the police. It was a triumph worthy of the front page, but I think it was the irony of the world's readiness for hero worship that made pricking the wanderer balloon such a satisfying episode in the life of Ben Hecht. End of chapter 8, part 1 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video thanks so much.